Hello, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining our webinar today. Um, so you can't open up LinkedIn or go to any event that is done using AI and machine learning. It's just exploded and it's everywhere. But what I hear sometimes is that marketers are kind of just confused on sort of what it is or what they should be looking at in regards to AI, what AI functionality is out there, how can they use it, how can they get benefit from it, you know, all of those things. So we're going to touch on one particular area of AI today, um, which is predictive analytics. Yeah, and we're going to look and cover this in terms of quite simply what it is and how you can use it in your marketing. Um, and then also, you know, we'll look at it in particular as how it can help you with some of the common challenges that you may have around your customer life cycle. So um, do you have too many single purchases? You know, do you need to grow more VIPs? Do you have a really high churn rate? So, you know, we'll touch on how predictive can help sort of optimize where those customers are along the life cycle um, and help you out with some of those core common challenges. Getting the slides moving along for you all. So I suppose just quickly, you know, who am I? So I'm Rachel Katardia, the Marketing Director at Red Eye. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Red Eye is a multi-channel marketing automation platform. Um, and, you know, as part of our offering, we already have sort of like five or six um, predictive models within our suite. So we're quite well versed really on sort of predictive. It's not new to us, um, which is obviously why we wanted to cover this topic today. Um, and then I'm joined by my colleague, James Richardson. Um, and James and his team essentially manage the predictive models with our clients, which is why he's joining me today to talk all things predictive. Um, but James, would you like to give a, a quick introduction on yourself? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, as Rachel men mentioned, I am James Richardson, database and multi-channel manager at Redeye. I've worked in data and marketing for 28 years, uh, the last eight being at Redeye. Uh, I manage the Data Insight team, and our team's main focus is working with data to help brands understand their data and customers' behaviour to improve marketing campaigns and, and communications. Thank you, James. So, yes, as you sort of just said, you know, James is and his team are uh, clued up on, you know, looking at the data and identify the behaviours, which is why, you know, it's perfect to join me on this webinar today. Um, so before we get into any of the content as well, um, just to sort of mention, if anyone does have any questions, then you can submit them through your question box. Um, and I will sort of occasionally take a look to see um, if, you know, we can answer any of those as and when they do come through as well. Okay, so let's then start by looking at what do we mean by predictive analytics? So there's a defini definition here from Investopedia that says, you know, the use of statistics and modeling techniques to make predictions around future outcomes and performance. Um, so that's okay, it's talking around predicting the future, um, but that sort of really lacks the why, essentially. Um, so, you know, James at Red Eye, we can help explain this a little bit further, can't we? Yeah, for me, it's all about understanding customer behavior so brands can best predict what the next action customers are going to make to then enable them to target customers at an appropriate time with an appropriate message. Yeah, so it's, it's essentially, like I said, that understanding of the behaviors, which then will enable you to send the right message at the right time, as you were sort of saying. Um, and, you know, this is why then we titled this webinar today, Prediction, Personas and Personalization, you know, because that's, you know, how at Red Eye, you know, we like to view it. So it helps you with the decisions, you know, the predicting, um, and that can ensure that you're targeting the right people, the personas, um, and then you can use that for better messaging, which is that all important personalization. So then, I know, I suppose if anyone's then wondering, well, Actually, how does it work? Um, so without getting too technical, James, then you're going to sort of explain here through a simple example of sort of how it works. Like. Yeah, we'll just go through this flow. So uh, models are built to predict a specific outcome, uh, which is usually uh, a challenge a brand is facing. Uh, for example, one of them might be knowing who is likely to make a first purchase. Uh, that outcome is mapped to the data points um, the brand has available. In the example I mentioned before around a first purchase, this would be website behavior. Uh, historical data is then mapped to pull together a picture of what previous customers did before to lead to that outcome. For example, what behaviors did a customer that made a first purchase do before their first purchase? 
Uh, that logic is then overlaid to your entire prospect base and each customer is given a score on the likelihood of showing that same signal, signs or behaviours, in this example, to making that first purchase. Those in the top percentile are then predicted to perform uh, the same action. You can then tailor your campaigns based on where the customer falls within the predictive segments. The models then continue to update in real time as more data is added and customers' behaviours change over time which is why it's great for running kind of automated campaigns. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think as well, it enables predictive to essentially help you get more out of the, the customer data that you already have, you know, because it, it, the data is essentially used in a different way to what, you know, marketers do currently. You know, we currently use the data to send a campaign and, you know, that is reacting to a specific behaviour or action, which is great. And um, so then this is then when you're using your data a step further and you're using that data to influence a future behavior essentially um, and then I suppose if we think around then benefits so that's one benefit you know getting more out of your customer data but if we think sort of more broadly you know what really are the benefits then of sort of using predictive in your marketing and we can view this in three ways so you as the marketer uh, the customer and obviously the business so if we start obviously with the marketer so everybody listening in, you know, you essentially want to know, okay, well, what do I get from it, you know? So in a nutshell, if you use sort of any of these predictive tools, it will help you and enable you to work smarter. Um, and the reason for this is because, you know, predictive uh, and sort of AI, it can analyze patterns in data far better than, you know, sort of we can do as the individual marketers, and it will continually learn and improve those recommendations on an ongoing basis as well. So this is then going to help you make better campaign decisions because you're going to have more accurate segments of, of groups of customers and those segments will be groups of customers that are likely to do something um, and then you can then craft you know what um, really will be highly personalized messages to either encourage a behavior so that could be like encouraging a purchase or discouraging a behavior so like an unsubscribe and obviously you can then do that far quicker then leaving it to sort of chance um, or it to sort of play out in sort of any current conditions. Um, so, you know, you can then rely on the predictive segments along with your automation functionality to send out all of these better campaigns for you. So with all of that sort of taken care of in the background, you know, you then, like I said, can be more efficient in what you do, perhaps change tact and, and launch more campaigns or actually just, you know, like I said, enable you to split, you know, redirect your time and effort perhaps on some more strategic projects that you sort of might have going on. Then arguably the most important person, the customer, um, you know, they are going to get a better brand experience. So they all, I always talk about this, that customers essentially just want to receive marketing messages that make sense to them. Okay, so this is then where predictive can then help you know help you target them with messages like i said that make sense to either the behavior that they're showing or likely to show and they're going to respond far better to those sort of campaigns and messages um, because it'll either show them that yes okay this brand knows who i am or it will sort of help encourage a behavior without that being obvious to the customer and um, which is also you know what we want and um, we also know then you know those customers that are more highly engaged stay loyal for a lot longer and then finally, then the third one, the business, you know, we can't forget that all of us as marketers work for a brand. So, you know, what does the business get from this? Well, simply it's more revenue. And that's what every company owner and senior management team want to hear. And that's because if the marketing team are using, using predictive, they're being more efficient with their time, they're getting more done, they can send more campaigns. And then the customers, they're more highly engaged because they're getting emails that make sense to them. Um, and you know that then can sort of more easily drive them to, to convert. Um, and that obviously just all leads to more revenue. And you know that could come from driving more multi-purchases within your customer base. Um, or just managing to retain more customers than you lose, you know, so that means that you're securing revenue that might have otherwise been lost. Um, or simply, you know, just having more engaged customers means that they actually will build a higher lifetime value for your brand. So lots of sort of different factors that sort of come together to essentially sort of, like I said, help increase the revenue that you can get from your customer campaigns. You know, so that all sounds great, um, but I suppose why isn't then everyone doing it already? Um, and so there are a few blockers that we believe are stopping marketers 
um, with this. And so, you know, hopefully we want to reassure people on that today. Um, so, James, then you're going to go through, I said, what we believe potentially some of the blockers that might be currently stopping marketers explore predictive analytics. Yeah, so we've highlighted three here, uh, data, definitions and skills, but we're also going to try and explain why they aren't necessarily blockers. So we'll start with data. Uh, people might think that they don't have the right data, but data does tend to always be available. And it's just getting access that can sometimes be the issue. So for example, if we want to use send time optimization, all you need is data and time of, of is date and time of the order, uh, which will be available somewhere. The unsubscribe model uses unsubscribe data, which everybody has. And the first purchase model requires prospect data from the website. Everyone has a website, so the data again will be available. All this data is available as I say, but it might just not be in a single customer view. Not having a single customer view so all the necessary data for each customer is held under one customer record can lead to inaccurate results. So if there are multiple records for the same customer, not all the transactional history or behavior data will be linked to that customer. Uh, so you know, it's not necessarily a blocker, just means the model won't be as accurate, but data sets can be built to replicate a single customer view to build the necessary model. Uh, in terms of volume of data, ideally we always say three years worth of data, three years worth of historical data, but can build models based on smaller data set. Just means again, the model won't be as accurate as having more data. So that's that's kind of data. Uh, we'll move on to what we mean by definitions. Um, there can be different definitions across the business on key life stage um, stage, on key lifestyle life cycle stages. Uh, there needs to be an agreed and unified definition so the model provides the correct results. So, for example, what classifies a VIP? Um, this can not only be different for different brands, but can also be interpreted differently internally by key stakeholders. So models are built to be bespoke. So it doesn't, again, need to be a blocker. Finally, we talk about skills. Uh, so some businesses don't have skills, resources, data scientists internally to build and run these models. Again, not a blocker, as resources available in terms like mine, in teams like mine, uh, that can help build these models and implement them effectively. So you don't need to be the expert in this. There's other people out there that can help. Yeah, exactly. These models, you know, are built and sort of ready for the marketers, as you say, you know, they don't need to worry about that. Um, which leads me on then to some actual models and some actual examples. So, you know, we've been through then, like I said, predictive as a whole. But what we are now wanted to sort of bring to life some specific examples, like I said, that you could all use. And I did mention at the beginning that, you know, Red Eye, we have a suite of models, um, but we're sort of going to sort of highlight some just essentially to give you all listening in a flavour of the sorts of things that are out there and that could be used. Um, and we're going to sort of cover these and go through the examples and they're sort of designed to sort of hopefully tackle core challenges that you we know that you face around key stages of the life cycle, as I've mentioned. Um, and then, like I said, just show you how predictive can help with those. So we're going to run through our top picks. Um, I'm going to look at it in terms of which one's the most popular, which is the easiest that you could get started with, the most underrated, most critical and the most valuable to think about now. So the first one then we're going to look at is Predictive Frequency Manager. And this is essentially what we're marking as the most popular uh, predictive model. Um, and this is also because, you know, mailing frequency is so important. You know, people think that they can just send lots of emails to everyone, you know, but that really is nothing to do um, at all. So, uh, James, then, do you want to give a quick overview uh, firstly on this model? Yeah, I can. So this model uh, uses historical data around customers interaction with previous email sends. It learns the optimum frequency uh, for your customers to avoid having mailing. So in basic terms, it finds customers that want more emails and sends them more and finds customers that want less emails and sends them less. So it creates segments based on customers interaction with emails and brands can then determine how they want to interact with these different customer segments. Uh, it also monitors new customers uh, through the beginning of their journey to determine the best segment for them to fall into. Okay, so yeah, quite simply, you know, it looks then, like I said, how how often someone's been opening and clicking with engaging with sort of prior campaigns, um, and then yeah, that will then help predict the best frequency to suit them sort of going forward, isn't it? And you know, that is you know quite important because you don't want to be over mailing somebody because then they can get annoyed, and then that leads to that dreaded unsubscribe, and that is the worst case scenario that we want for sort of any marketers. And 
we have a client, GTEC, who actually used this model. Um, initially, they implemented it back when the pandemic hit. Um, and that was because they saw their database grow quite rapidly. And they thought, OK, well, emails actually now have become a really core channel for us. Um, so they wanted to actually increase the volumes of emails they were sending um, to obviously hope get some more conversions. But they were worried about actually um, how sending more to the database, you know, what would that impact would that have on their you know, customers? Could they handle that increase in communications? Um, but also, you know, frequency has to be managed as to not damage your sender reputation as well, which you know can be impacted with any you know increases in volumes. Um, so as James was just talking about, the model then looked at their customers' historic engagement uh, trends and sort of placed them into these predictive engagement segments. So then they could identify those customers that will be willing to receive more emails versus those that sort of weren't. And these predictive uh, segments then, you know, meant that they could now send you know, the right message the, to the right people at the right time, but also at the best frequency for that individual. Um, and that meant, you know, they were seeing average open rates of, you know, over 40 percent, which is very good. Um, but all importantly, what they defined as their engaged segment, that those engaged contacts grew by 17 percent, all from just managing frequently, frequency a bit more effectively. So the next one then is the easiest thing to get started with. Um, and this one we've chosen the likelihood of making a first purchase. Um, so then James, why would you say this one's then the easiest to get started with? It's kind of the easiest to get started with mainly because everyone has a website uh, and this model uses website data. So it uses tagging data to identify potential customers that have visited the site but haven't yet made a purchase. Uh, there will be potential customers that already exist on your database via newsletters, subscriptions, competitions, etc., but haven't made that first purchase yet. Uh, the model simply looks at the behaviours of previous customers before they made their first purchase. These behaviours are then overlaid onto the potential customers to identify which ones are most likely to make that first purchase. Um, it can then pinpoint from, the, from those visits which customers are likely to buy and can be targeted accordingly. It enables you to turn website visitors from being prospects that have visited your website into customers that can transact and start their journey with you really yeah and you know getting that tag on your website as you've sort of just said is already one of the first things that happens when you start to send behavioral based automation so it's there you've got it um and it's just like i said using that data in a different way as you sort of said before and um, so yeah definitely one of the, I think, the easiest to sort of you know implement to start with um but also you know the importance of this is well because everyone's got acquisition targets um, and if you think about it, these people have already signed up for your comms or newsletter already. They just haven't made that first purchase yet. And you'd have probably paid to acquire them. So you want them to become a paying customer as quick as possible, essentially. Um, and so this can obviously help move that along. So the third one then um, is all around VIPs. Um, and we actually, you know, class this one as the most underrated sort of predictive model. Um, and we say that because a lot of businesses look at repetition as a whole and encouraging sort of repeat purchases from everyone, um, which is OK. Um, but you're much better to sort of find and nurture that extra special group um, of what, you know, what we would call sort of VIPs. Um, so then how does this sort of likelihood to become a VIP model then work, James? Well, the first thing that needs to be done, as we mentioned earlier, is to determine what classifies a customer as being a VIP. Uh, it's usually based on frequency purchased and amount spent, but obviously this can vary across different businesses. Uh, the model uses historical transactional data to identify VIPs in the existing database, then identify similar patterns with non-VIP customers that are likely to increase their spend to become VIPs. Uh, this results in increased loyalty by uncovering who will become your next most valuable customers. Uh, then campaigns can be tailored to treat these customers in a different way. They will become more loyal to you if they are treated as VIPs. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as you were sort of saying, a VIP is different to every business, you know, and so soon as you know what that is, you know, you, you know, you, this can help you find more of them and encourage them to sort of tip into that VIP bracket sooner, you know, rather than them waiting to sort of do it on their own accord, you know, as the more VIPs that you have, you know, that is ultimately better for the long term sort of value you have, you know, growing your business. And, you know, again, this model was used um, with great success by one of our clients, Travis Perkins. So, you know, 
just as we've sort of said, the model then applied to their sort of database and it essentially searched their customer database for patterns of behavior that reflected the behavior of their current sort of current VIPs. Um, and then, then in this case, Travis Perkins then used a multi-channel approach to, uh, to try and encourage them to that next to do that next behavior, which in this case was reach a certain spend amount so that they became in that VIP segment. Um, and obviously then by using that predictive, that meant they could grow, they grew their VIP segment by 65%. Um, and you know, that larger VIP segment then essentially helped drive up their you know, customer lifetime value um, by 34% as well. And obviously, so then ultimately, you know, Travis Perkins were getting customers that were sort of more profitable to them over the long term. So the fourth one then we're going to cover, um, you know, we'd like to highlight is predictive churn. And we've labeled this as the most critical um, because, you know, all marketers, you know, we have churn targets um, and they need to be as low as, you know, those numbers of churn need to be as low as possible because you need to sort of build and grow your customer database and, and not lose too many customers. Um, so, James, can you talk through this model? Yeah, so a lot of focus uh, tends to be on new business, but churn is arguably as important, if not more important. Um, this model uses historical transactional data to look at not on, only how long each customer hasn't made a purchase, but also how often and what they have purchased in the past. It then predicts those customers that are likely to leave you. Then you can re-engage customers with key campaigns before they turn to a competitor. Uh, you don't want to lose any customers, especially as some could be high value customers that you want to keep. Overall, this model, um, so overall this model helps to stop customers falling out of that leaky bucket and you can continue to build that relationship with them. Yeah. And again, you know, just to straight away sort of bring this to life, um, another one of our clients, All Beauty, used this one. And essentially they used to have a re-engagement campaign that triggered um, after what they defined a business time frame of 12 months. Okay. So if a customer hadn't purchased with them in 12 months, then they were, you know, sent this reactivation campaign to draw them back. And I'm sure lots of you with the marketers, you know, have campaigns like this and that's a great automation but what you have to think is that 12 months might be okay to sort of recoup some customers back but it might be too late for others and you might have already lost their business because each customer has an individual purchasing pattern uh, purchasing pattern essentially um, so this model then like I said helped identify um, and predict the moment of lapsing for each individual customer okay and then the automation was then triggered to re-engage them back at that individual level um, and you know all beauty saw over 400 percent increase in sales 500 percent increase in revenue just from using the predictive model to predict and trigger that reactivation campaign um, to each individual versus it just being sent at that generic time frame and I'm sure you'll all agree that they're, they're pretty pretty good results <laughs> and okay then finally likelihood of making a second purchase and we have labeled this one as the most valuable for now because obviously with Black Friday and peak campaigns uh, you know peak approaching lots of brands you know you do put out big discounts and big offers you know to try and draw in as many new customers as you can but with that then you often attract you know discounters um, and potentially then we always see that brands can struggle with that single purchases segment after black friday so this is why you know we say it's most valuable to think about now and something to potentially consider so james do you want to just briefly cover this final model yeah so it's very common as you say for many brands to have a high number of single purchases on their database um but it doesn't necessarily have that, that doesn't always have to be that way uh this model can help identify some customers that are likely to make a second purchase if they're provided with a suitable offer to make them at a suitable time so again, it uses historical transaction data and timeframes between first and second purchase to identify customers most likely to make a second purchase at a certain time rather than remain as a single purchaser. So this model then helps to create more repeat purchases by predicting which customers will purchase from you again. Yeah, and we've just said that, that you know, that single purchase segment is the most difficult to crack. Um, and like I said, it could be full of, you know, lots of people that you've kind of collected from offers and, and promotions and 
um, you know, so we do see that being quite a big segment for sort of brands. Um, so, you know, don't don't worry if, if that segment is large for you guys, but then this is a way to sort of help reduce that. Um, but I think, you know, you always you have to understand that, you know, not everybody will become a multi-purchaser. Some people will stay in your databases only for purchasing with you once. Um, but you know, if you can use a tool like this to sort of, you know, like a model to help predict which ones are most likely to make that second purchase, it's all about encouraging that action a little bit quicker. Um, you know, because we have a first, second purchase infographic um, on our website and we talk about, you know, how the more purchases that somebody makes, the stickier they sort of get. And I think once they've then sort of made a second purchase with you, they're 46% more likely to make a third purchase. And that percentage gets higher and higher the more they purchase. So like I said, it's really, really key to just try and drive that stickiness as soon as possible. And so, so then we've looked at these sort of that our five top picks um, of the modules. Um, and we've looked at it in terms of, like I said, common uh, things that we know brands struggle with around the customer life cycle but you know we also know that you know every business is unique and you all have your own individual challenges and um, so predictive models can actually be built quite bespoke around bespoke challenges can't they James? Yes they can so if we don't have a standard model that meets that requirement we can build something that can overcome a particular challenge so for example uh, my team have, have built a kind of a direct mail campaign predictive model uh, so this model predicts the likelihood that a customer will purchase from the direct mail campaign. It uses uh, previous campaign performance and transactional data to help predict uh, customer behavior. So each customer is given a score basically from zero to 100, 100 being that that customer is more likely to purchase off the back of that direct mail campaign. Uh, therefore, we can use it. So sending and printing direct mail can be expensive. Uh, so sending to those customers that are likely to purchase will enhance the performance of that campaign. Uh, after campaign analysis is run, uh, to assess the performance of that model and improvement is, is always done as required yeah exactly so this is a great example of you know like i said that like james was just saying a direct mail challenge that, that a brand had and, and predictive can actually be used to sort of implement that so you know really ai can help everyone sort of whatever your business challenge so to speak so I wanted to kind of leave you then with all one final parting message um, and this isn't to scare any of you um, but hopefully today you know we've shared with you the real advantages that you can get by you know using AI in terms of sort of like predictive like we've just gone through um, but you know you hear this term all the time and many people say you know AI might get rid of our jobs as marketers but I very much believe that it won't but the marketers that are taking advantage of AI, they're working smarter, they're being more efficient, they're improving their performance, they might take over your jobs. <laughs> so um, that's it sort of from us. Um, James, do you have any final words to wrap up uh, Wrap up from you? Yeah, you're just a, a couple of words really. So yeah, I mean, predictive models, modeling can sometimes be a scary subject, as you say, uh, but hopefully today we have reassured you that it isn't the case and it can be really beneficial for all brands. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. So I haven't seen that any questions have come through from anybody either as well. But um, if you do have something um, that you sort of like to ask either myself or James, um, then you can reach out to us at Red Eye or obviously on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, just bang on on time as well, 30 minutes at half 11. So thank you all very much for listening in and bye bye.